Sure. Should I start? OK. So in the, in the first lecture, we discussed that models uh, with this type of couplings lead to melt-on diagrams, and we can uh, represent them by a, an integral which looks like, um, like a semi-classical system in the sense that for large n, it's close to classical. Uh, then uh, we discussed that the low energies, today we discussed that the low energies, the path integral can be divided basically in two pieces. One is the fluctuations in the direction orthogonal to some valley, uh, and those will give us conformal invariant answers. Uh, that's uh, this part of, of the path integral. And then uh, a term that uh, gives us the leading violation, leading uh, perturbation away from the conformal answers, uh, which is given by, um, by this action involving a Schwarzian. And terms that come from this action will be enhanced for a low energy. So low energies that will give us a big factor because the, this action is suppressed by a small factor when the energy is small. Okay? So that's, uh, that's what we've seen. Now, I probably should mention an example from particle physics. I mean, for um, how many of you know the chiral Lagrangian for pions? You familiar? Yeah. Well, some of them. Yeah, I guess it was. Well, okay, this might help be helpful for the people who raise their hand. Um, so you can uh, consider QCD, right? QCD in the real world. Um, QCD, if, if the quark masses were exactly zero, then uh, we would have an exact uh, chiral symmetry, SU2, uh, time, SU2 left times SU2 right symmetry. Um, when the SU2s are different from the left and right, that's a chiral symmetry. And that chiral symmetry is, a, is an exact symmetry of the QCD Lagrangian with zero, zero fermion masses. Um, and that symmetry is spontaneously broken uh, uh, by the dynamics of QCD, right? Spontaneously broken to just an SU2. And the ghost on bosons of this uh, break, so you can think of the, the target space as a uh, three-dimensional sphere, and the ghost on bosons of this breaking are the pions, right? Um, so the three pions. So the, the breaking selects a point on the three sphere, and then you can, uh, you can get three displacements uh, away from that point, and that gives you the three pions that are exactly massless in that lemon, right? So those are the ghost on bosons. Is this, this familiar to everyone? Um, so maybe I should draw the, so there's the three sphere. So this three sphere uh, parameterizes the space of vacua. So we select uh, one point and then the chiral symmetry would move us around and small fluctuations around here are the, the various pions, the three pions. But in the real world QCD, the fermion masses are not zero. So um, we will get, so the fact that we have the fermion masses in the ultraviolet theory so in the microscopic theory, implies that we'll have some masses for these pions in, the, in this theory. And this mass term uh, will be some kind of potential for the fields on this sphere. And uh, you can, um, by looking at the quantum numbers of the fermion bilinear, so psi left times uh, psi right, which is the, uh, or, or the, the, the chiral and antichiral fermion fields, which uh, are what appear in the mass term in the microscopic Lagrangian, and how they transform under the chiral symmetry, we can say what this uh, fermion mass term should look like. So fermion mass term should be something, some uh, trace of some uh, mass matrix times uh, the uh, a variable omega, which uh, is, uh, lives on an, on an S3, okay? And uh, so it could be, you can think of this as a unitary matrix in, uh, a unitary matrix, um, a two by two unitary matrix. And so this is the type of potential that you get, um, and uh, that then uh, determines the, uh, the effect of the fermion masses. So what you see is that from the UV term and the symmetries of the UV term, you determine the term that you get in the infrared, which uh, has this form. And this term in these particular cases will, uh, the various components here will involve the, ver the fer various fermion masses, right? They appear just linearly in this expression. Anyway, so that's uh, analogous to, somewhat analogous to what we discussed today. So, um, well, let, let me just emphasize one point, 
which is the fact that even though chiral symmetry is not a symmetry of QCD in the real world, uh, we still can use the chiral symmetry because it is um, broken very weakly. Okay, so it's a symmetry that is broken weakly, and we have this pattern. So this chiral symmetry is um, both um, spontaneously and explicitly broken, right? So spontaneously broken by the the webs here that select the point on the S3, and also uh, explicitly broken by the mass terms. Okay. So uh, in that sense, it is uh, rather similar to what we discussed today, where we had this representation symmetry that was both spontaneous and explicitly broken. Uh, one, one important difference is that uh, this representation symmetry where it was infinite dimensional, is also non-compact. Uh, so those are some, some differences. So in the case of QCD, the theory with the symmetry makes sense. So it makes sense to consider QCD with exactly zero fermion masses. Uh, the model we discussed before uh, this integral over g and sigma variables, if we have the exact symmetry, does not make sense. We get some infinities. Okay? And the microscopic model does not have the symmetry. Is that uh, clear? Does it clarify anything? No? Um, okay, so uh, I, I now would like to discuss in a little more detail one application of the computation of the four point function. So I'll. Um, this is um, this is one application of this SYK model and one interesting point about this, and it's the application to quantum chaos. So we'll uh, discuss one aspect of quantum chaos and how uh, we can use this uh, SYK model to analyze it. Um, so how many of you have uh, heard about quantum chaos? Um, yeah, so, um, okay, um, let me see. How much detail do you want me to give about, how, how much do you want me to speak about this topic? <laughs> yeah, so you would like some detail on this? Uh, yeah, okay. Well, um, Okay, you, you've all uh, heard about classical chaos, right? So the question is only relevant if you give an alternative. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I could expand more, but I, I, I'm feeling I'm losing you, so I, I, I'm getting the feeling that I'm losing you. Is, is that feeling correct or not? Yes. How many people think that I'm losing you? <laughs> okay. Uh, well. It's a small fraction, but maybe maybe people didn't. Maybe I should have turned around before I ask the question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's discuss classical chaos. Okay, so um, chaos is the idea that you you can have two systems. It's an extreme sensitivity to initial conditions, so we can have, let's say, the time evolution of some system. So here. The blackboard is phase space, P's and Q's. Um, and then we start, we displace the system a little bit in the initial condition, and it will follow a trajectory which initially is very close to this one. Then it has a period of uh, exponential, well, it, it, even from the sort of, after a little while, it will have a period of exponential um, diversions from the initial condition. Um, so this is what we call the Lyapunov regime. I don't remember whether it was with Y or with I, anyway. Um, and then, uh, if let's say the phase space is somewhat finite, uh, we could be in an energy surface or something, then the two are, uh, after a very long time, one might end up here and the other one might end up there. So very big difference. So there is a period of exponential increase and then, uh, well, it cannot continue to increase exponentially because the system is finite, but they will somehow, if one is here, the other one could be anywhere in the, phase space, okay? So that's uh, some features of classical chaos. Now, um, what happens in quantum mechanics? So now we have quantum mechanics. Um, now, something people sometimes say, and I really don't like when people say this, um, 
is that the Schrodinger equation is linear and therefore there is no classical, there is no quantum chaos, okay? Um, now, why don't I like this? Um, so uh, so the, the Schrodinger equation uh, is linear and therefore um, there is no quantum chaos. So if you take the difference or the distance between two solutions, two solutions of this equation, that will stay constant through the evolution because the linear equation. Um, now, that should be compared. Uh, the reason I don't like it is because the wave function is somewhat analogous to the phase space distri distribution in classical physics. So if we take the distribution, we take a distribution in phase space in classical physics, um, then uh, this, this distribution, of course, it's not identical because uh, this is more like d squared, but for the purposes of uh, this discussion, that's a small difference. Um, this, this equation is also linear, so it's a Poisson bracket of H with rho, okay? And so indeed, if you have two phase space distributions and we define some distance between the two, let's say some L2 norm or something, uh, then that also would remain constant, okay? So here the chaos was in the in the values of the coordinates, right, in the values of the observables, as we evolve them in time, we see uh, this, this difference and this divergence. Um, now, one way to think about this classical chaos is to say, well, let's imagine that we want to understand how much the system has uh, been displaced when we made, made a small change in the initial conditions. Um, so how will we calculate this? So we have to, so let's say this is some position, um, well, let, let me call it this Q of T, right? Um, so let's say we want to compute the derivative. Well, we, we have the position Q at T, right? And it will depend on the initial condition, let's say uh, the momentum at time equal to zero and the position at time equal to zero, right? So given these two positions, we can calculate Q of T. And now we want to uh, see what happens if we change this a little bit, how much uh, this changes. And that change, so that delta Q is given by the Poisson bracket. For example, if we change P, it's given by, so the derivative with respect to P is just the Poisson bracket with Q at zero, right? So Q zero is just uh, Q at zero. And the Poisson bracket between these two is the derivative uh, with respect to P zero, okay? So that, this is given us, so this Poisson bracket is delta Q delta P zero, right? So the partial derivative, if you wish, dQ of time T, uh, d P at zero, right? Okay, good. Now, of course, yeah, this is the diversions, the, the, this is the, 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 the displacement that we get, get, and we expect this in, in chaotic system to uh, grow exponentially. Now, an example of a chaotic system is uh, motion in hyperbolic space. Imagine you have uh, let's say this is hyperbolic space, and we have a particle that moves in a target space, which is hyperbolic space. Then if we have a particle, let's say, moving along here, and we start out a particle that uh, is very close to this, then we'll find another geodesic in hyperbolic space, but the distance between these two uh, grows exponentially, right? Because of the negative curvature of hyperbolic space. So that's a very simple example. This is an example where the, uh, the phase space is infinite, right? Um, uh, you can make it finite by considering hyperbolic space. You can quotient hyperbolic space into a Riemann surface, and then when the particle gets here, it's refle reflected and so on, you can have a hyperbolic billiard. Uh, again, a chaotic system now with a finite uh, phase space if you restrict to also a finite energy. Okay. So in this case, the chaos is very, uh, so it's somehow a very simple, this initial derivation is a simple geometric property. But it doesn't have to be. I mean, you can have a, the motion of uh, some more complicated, like a three-body system in Newtonian uh, general relativity, in, in Newtonian uh, physics. And there will be regions in that phase space where, again, will be chaotic. Okay, okay so um, that's um, the story. Now, imagine that uh, we had the system at finite temperature, and we somehow wanted to find the average uh, of this growth. I mean, it might be that some trajectory has a large growth, but another trajectory has, uh, I don't know, a different Lyapunov of experiment. We want to make uh, the average over all trajectories, right? So we could take this and take the average of this, but, um, and that might, 
that might vanish because uh, maybe for some this is positive and for some this is negative. So it's not uh, very smart to just take the average of this quantity. It's a little better to take the average of the square of this quantity. Um, and then uh, if we take the thermal average of this, then we will not have those cancellations. And it will give us an idea of how much uh, this is. So these two are diversion. OK. Now we could also have a system that has many different particles, many types of particles. So this could be um, this could be the position of particle number one, could be a gas of particles, and this the position of uh, particle number three, let's say, or other particle number n, let's say, some other particle very different. Um, so those uh, also in a gas of interacting particles, we also expect it to grow exponentially for some range of times. Um, now the analog of this, so well, all of this was uh, just classical, so we, we are not yet in the quantum. Well, we, okay. So now we go to the quantum case. And so in the quantum case, uh, so the analog of that classical chaos is to talk about the commutators of two operators. So we take, we take two simple operators. Um, um, the, we are going to call them W and V in this talk. I should say that uh, everything that I'm going to say about chaos is based on uh, work by Schenker, Schenker, uh, Stanford, and Kitaev. Okay. Um, so we can take this and then, uh, so this is, uh, um, this is uh, an anti-Hermitian operator. We take the square, we might put a minus sign. So this uh, quantity is positive. Uh, it's a positive operator. We can uh, take the thermal average of this, and we can see how it behaves. And so we'll define the quantum Lyapunov exponent to be uh, basically the growth of this, uh, so lambda times t. This is just the definition of lambda. So if we have a system with many uh, particles, uh, many degrees of freedom, many qubits, uh, then we think of just, just to fix, to, to, to have a picture, you could imagine a system with many qubits that has some, some Hamiltonian. And um, you can think of V and W as being just the single qubit operators, one acting on one of the qubits and the other one acting on a different qubit, okay? So at, at time equal to zero, they are acting on different qubits, but as we uh, evolve, yeah, so there. At time equal to zero, they commute because they act on different qubits, and then as time evolves, they will fail to commute. We'll discuss that in a little in more detail later. Um, but if the system has some kind of large n limit, uh, then we expect that uh, this commutator will involve uh, some inverse power of n. So the general uh, behavior of this commutator is uh, expected to be um, the following. So initially, they com so this is time, and uh, this is the value of the commutator. So let me call it C for commutator. So it starts out being zero. Um, now, at very late times, if uh, this is just a qubit operator, let's say sigma acting on the first qubit, then at late times, this, will, this operator will be so complicated that it will have some overlaps. It will have a non-trivial commutator with our qubit operator. Um, and uh, so, but the biggest uh, commutator could have, it could be, could have a piece that contains uh, the various sigma matrices of this qubit operator. So this commutator would be of order one. So the biggest, it could be something of order one. Maybe it's one quarter or two or two or four, whatever. Uh, but it's uh, something of order one. And here we expect something that grows exponentially, but is of order uh, one over n times e to the lambda t. And then it will, uh, then it saturates at one for very late times, okay? So this time where this grows appreciably is sometimes called the scrambling time. So it's a T where um, it's a time of order. So this time is of order one over lambda times logarithm of n, okay? Um, okay, so this is the expected behavior. So the, 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 the picture of what's happening is, is basically the following. So imagine you take, um, you want to calculate W of t, right? So to, to first approximation, so this is W of zero, 
and then plus, let's say, T, the commutator of the Hamiltonian with uh, W, right? With W of zero. And then you could continue expanding this, uh, T squared, uh, H, H. This is just the time evolution, uh, and we are just uh, calculating the time evolution. Yes? Yeah, t equal to zero, we just take two operators that commute. So it's analogous to taking, uh, let's say, one of these is the position of one particle, and this is the position of some other particle. Yeah, t equal to zero here, this would be zero, right? And then we have the w at zero and b at zero commute. We are. Uh, oh, 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 sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, th this is the behavior after some time, okay? So here they might have some value which is of order one, uh, one over n. Okay, le let me be more precise. So this is equal to some number of order one divided by n uh, uh, plus this, okay? Um, so w w I'm w w this, this period of exponential growth, um, um, will come, so if we take literally what I said that they commute in the beginning, this number here, uh, well, the, the, the point is that we, we acquire this period of ex ex exponential growth after some time, okay? Uh, of course, uh, whatever this is, it should be invariant under t goes to minus t, so it cannot be like this exactly, right? Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm going to try to explain why we have, I'm, I'm going into that now. So uh, this is what we expect we have in a chaotic system. Well, first of all, classically we have that. Uh, and I'm going to try to explain now from the quantum point of view why we expect that. Okay. Um, so what, if you have a model like, for example, this SYK model that we were talking about, we could have that, uh, let's say B is, let's say Psi 1, one of the fermions and W is, let's say, Psi 2, another fermion, okay? Um, now, when we, uh, so this expansion will be of the form Psi 2, and then we have T, and then we have the commutator of the Hamiltonian with Psi 2, right? And uh, the, the Hamiltonian is over there, contains four fermions, so we'll get a J, 2, L, M, N, Psi L, Psi M, Psi N, okay? So we see that we started with only Psi 2, and then after the first application of the Hamiltonian, we get 3, okay? Now let's uh, apply the Hamiltonian again. So the term that has a T squared, so the first application of the Hamiltonian will give us a factor like this, and then the second application of the Hamiltonian will give us a factor where we insert, again, we could take this commutator, so we'll have three Psi's here, right? Okay? So we'll have three Psi's here, and, and so on. Um, and then we apply the Hamiltonian again, um, and then uh, each of them, each of the size appearing here can again split and so on. So we get the kind of tree-like structure for the various terms that we get here. So, um, so it, now, what's, if we're not trying to calculate the commutator with Psi 1, what is relevant is how many times Psi 1 appears here, right? So here Psi 1 can appear in one of these terms, of course, this is small. So this, this has a small variance proportional to one over n to some power. Um, but it can be, well, in any of these terms. But when we go to these higher and higher order terms where there are more, where the number of psi's is growing exponentially, then uh, the probability that we get psi 1 uh, grows, goes up. Right? So it's more likely that we have psi 1. Um, so this is a picture that is uh, sometimes called operator spreading. So you have uh, a set of simple operators at equal to 0. And then when you do the time evolution, the time evolution of a simple operator is going to be a complicated operator. So something like this that contains many of the simple operators at time equal to zero. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's an operator which is spreading among all the uh, operators that we initially had. And so after a long time, let's say this time here, the typical length of, um, of things we have, we, we, there will be terms that contain all n fermions. So the probability that psi one appears is just one. And, uh, will be one, and it will appear in some of the terms. So that's, uh, that's the picture for why uh, we expect it to, to grow. 
Okay. So initially, we emphasized that we take two that commute, but even if uh, they didn't commute by some small amount, uh, we, we expect that this effect will make uh, the non-commutator, the commutator grow, um, grow basically due to this operator spreading, the, the fact that operators grow uh, inside the Hilbert space. Okay. Um, notice this is not really a growth of the operator in space. I mean, there's no space in this model. They're, they're, they're all connected, but uh, it's a growth in this uh, basis of simple operators, that the simple, each simple term appears many times. Um, okay, so, um, yeah. So the, 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 the basic uh, point is that as time evolves, let, let me contrast uh, two types of evolution. So imagine that we have a, fermion, a single fermion moving in a circle, right? Then if, at time equal to zero, I can act with the operator here, and then at later times, if it is a free fermion, it will spread uh, all over the circle, right? So we start spreading on the circle. That's sometimes the quantum mechanical spreading of a particle. But it will remain just a single operator. So it will be a superposition of the operator acting at zero, acting at these points, and so on. The spreading we have here is uh, much bigger. So it's, um, if we had not a free particle, but an interacting fermion system, um, we would have that after some time, uh, all the operators here are appearing, in the sense that the typical operator will contain uh, products of size at uh, all the intermediate points, okay? Uh, that, that's for a system with spatial extent. And sometimes the, the growth of this, uh, of this surface is called, the, the, the velocity of this growth is called the butterfly velocity, etc. But so what I'm, I'm trying to, understand, to, to explain is that this is not just the spreading of a single particle we are used to in quantum mechanics. This is the spreading really in the Hilbert space and uh, getting the operator to be more complicated. That? Uh, sign. So um, you mean sign of lambda t? Um, well, yeah, so the, the exponential comes from, uh, from this notion that this tree grows exponentially. So the, the, the system, it, this, this behavior that I'm discussing here is true for large n systems. So systems that have uh, many components, uh, many different sort of components, they could be either local, or in this case, they are, they are related non-locally, but the Hamiltonian is what's called k-local. So the Hamiltonian uh, involves a few fermions at a time, right? The Hamiltonian is not such that it, given an operator, it produces a million other operators after a one instance, or one action of the Hamiltonian. Given an operator, it produces four, uh, three operators, for example, right? And then uh, the structure of these Hamiltonians is such that the growth on the number of operators that you get is, um, is exponential. It's not intuitive that it's exponential, so let me try to make it more intuitive. So we have, we have one, one of the fermions, then it can give rise to three fermions. Then when we do these commutators, this, com this Hamiltonian is a sum of many terms, and so it can act on any of these individually and produce other three fermions, okay? This is, this is after one action of the Hamiltonian, this is after two actions of the Hamiltonian, let's say. Then another action of the Hamiltonian, right? So you see that the number that of fermions that we get grows exponentially. Is that uh, more intuitive now? Yeah. But all those terms we are having together, they do something to find, right? Yes, yes. So why is it so Yeah. Um, indeed, if you, if you calculate the, I mean, this comes with some coefficients and the, um, this comes with some coefficients, but the, uh, the, the, the basic point is that the, there is a growth in the length of the operator. So there is a growth in the typical length of the operator. So the, the typical operator contains many, many psi's, right? A number of psi's that grows exponentially. And uh, it's that exponential growth. So each coefficient will be small, um, but uh, the fact that you have many makes it more probable that the particle number one will appear, that the, let's say, first operator will appear within that sum. Um, I'm not sure if, uh, um, 
Gedanken. Yeah, so this is a picture of what you expect in general, and then you can compute this in specific cases and find that this is indeed what happens. So, um, okay, so um, so I'm going back to this question of the sign. Uh, so the idea is that these uh, commutators will be small; they will be small one over n of x, but uh, it's a one over n effect that is growing exponentially until it saturates and it becomes another one effect. Okay. And only in systems with large n, you have this big separation between short times and very long times, and so that you can have this period of exponential growth. If you had a finite n system, you, the commutator might just grow fast and become a further one quickly. Or it might oscillate or whatever, it depends on, on, on the particular system. So in these large n systems, you expect it to saturate. Of course, you could have a quantum Poincaré recurrence and so on after a very long time, and then it decreases again, but that's uh, doubly exponential. I mean, very extremely long times. Okay, so um, now it, it is convenient. Uh, are there any other questions? So we, we are computing this uh, quantity, and it's convenient, uh, this is just uh, only a, for now a technical convenience, to separate this, uh, this operator into, um, so there are terms that uh, contain, let's say, b of zero, w of t squared, uh, v of zero. Okay, so let me write it as w of t, v of zero. And then there are some other terms that contain w of t, um, v of zero, w of t, v of zero. Okay, and then there are two other terms that have uh, roughly the same structure. So the structure here is uh, that in this case, uh, this we call the time-ordered operator, in the sense that we first act with at zero, then act at t, and then we can think of this as an inner product of uh, having acted with these two operators, uh, I mean, of the state that we obtain after acting with the two operators. So if we wanted to compute this, we could, uh, yeah. So it, it's an, an experiment that in order to compute this quantity would only require us to evolve the system forwards in time. Okay, so it's a relatively simple thing to do. Well, this one will involve uh, acting with the operator at zero, evolving to time t, then going back in time to time zero, and then uh, going forwards in time to time t. So this is, uh, sometimes called an out-of-time order uh, correlator. Um, okay, now what do we expect the, the large time behavior of this one to be? So um, let's let's uh, think about this. Um, so um, um, yeah, so here uh, it's useful to if you want to compute this. Let's say in the thermal ensemble, it's useful to think about the Skeldish contour type calculation that uh, I was asked about in the morning. So we have the Euclidean time evolution that is related to the fact that we are computing this at some temperature. And then we have some operators here and then some operators here in the future. Um, now, um, here when we uh, insert these operators in the future, there will be a, a piece uh, of this correlator that uh, will be given just by the expectation value of uh, each operator separately, and then some piece that will uh, connect them both, that will involve the propagation of some part, of some effective, let's say, two-point function at, uh, at long times. But we said that uh, two-point equal time, well, the, the correlation functions at long times decay exponentially with time, so we would expect that in this situation, um, any correction to uh, this uh, factorized answer will decay exponentially with time. So the leading order term will be the factorized answer. So um, this piece uh, somehow doesn't decay with time. Okay, it stays more or less constant. Especially it's uh, achieved some constant at very long times. Now this piece, at short times, they commute. 
So it's basically the same as this piece, and it will be a constant that would cancel this piece. So this starts out being zero because of a cancellation between these two. But the idea is that in this case, uh, we, this uh, correlator will, is expected to decrease exponentially with time. So the statement that the commutator grows is completely equivalent to the statement that this uh, starts out constant and then uh, decreases exponentially with time until eventually becomes zero. So this is the, the behavior of, I'm plotting here, the expected behavior of this, if the behavior of the commutator was that one. Okay. So talking about the growth of the commutator or the decrease of the out-of-time order correlator is, uh, is exactly the same. Okay. You can think of this as the, and we'll later perhaps uh, use that language, uh, as the inner product between two, two different states. One is a state that you use by acting with the operator at zero, and, the, and then the operator at t, versus a state where you act first with the operator w of t, and then with the operator b of zero. Okay. Um, well, maybe I, maybe I won't talk about that uh, now. But um, well. Um, okay. So uh, so we have these things, and now um, we would like to uh, compute these uh, quantities in the SYK model, okay, at low temperatures. Now, no, notice that um, if, you have a, if you have a model that is uh, chaotic, it's typically not solvable, okay, because chaos means it's complicated. But we, we'll see that uh, this SYK model, despite uh, being solvable, it also displays chaos, and that's one of the interesting aspects of it. Okay. So, um, 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 let's see. Um, how much detail I want to give. So, um, so we're going to compute, so we, the computation is boils down to the computation of a four-point function. So we're interested in computing that four-point function of, uh, let's say, some operator psi, um, psi i of, uh, let's say, zero, well, psi i of t, this is w, psi j of zero, psi i of t, psi j of zero. So we try to compute this uh, quantity in the uh, in the SYK model. Just for it not to be too singular, let me just displace these times a little bit. So let me call it, uh, well, le le let me just ignore that. So let's just try to compute this. Um, well, let me, so this is zero plus some small number. And, well, let me, let me keep zero and uh, we'll keep in mind that we'll displace them in a little bit. Um, so, um, so we can understand this as, uh, so this can be computed in terms of a contour that does the following thing. So we start at uh, zero time, then we go to large time. So here we insert the psi j, then here we insert this guy, psi i, then we go back to zero and insert the uh, psi j again. And then we go back to some late time and insert the uh, psi i again. So we're going to imagine that time, this time is very large, and these two maybe could be slightly displaced or not. Yeah, so. um, okay, so we're interested in this computation, and since we want to do it in uh, using the low energy theory, um, we would like to um, make sure that no times are very small here, and that involves uh, sort of shifting, that, that's why I was talking about shifting these times, just in this relative to that so that we don't have two fermions at the same time, okay? So we could do that. We shift them in such a way by an amount of order beta, let's say. And that's fine. So I'm going to implicitly assume that. Um, now, how can we get this correlator from the Euclidean theory? So imagine we have the Euclidean theory. So we have the Euclidean diagram. And uh, the order of the correlators in the Lorentzian theory is related to the time ordering that you have in the Euclidean theory. So here we have fermion psi j, psi i, psi j, and psi i. If we take them displaced in this way in the Euclidean theory, um, then 
uh, we can uh, analytically continue, uh, let's say, these j's into, or all of them into Lorentzian time, right? Um, and uh, we can use an I epsilon prescription consistent with this ordering, then we'll get that particular ordering of operators. This is just something very general in any, any system, any quantum mechanical system, this is true, uh, field theory or whatever. So you start with some ordering in Euclidean signature, you bring them all close together and then uh, analytically continue. Okay. Um, sh yeah, just to avoid uh, this, um, this issue about uh, the two being at the same time, we can displace them uh, by beta over two. So this time could be plus uh, beta over, over four, let's say, and this plus beta over two. And then this plus three beta over two. And in this way, we um, can have a picture where that's a way to, of regulating this, each of these operators. So we have psi i here, psi j. And then we continue, uh, let's say, two of them to Lorentzian signature. Okay? So we, we make a very long Lorentzian time. So that's a simple thing we could do. OK. Now, Um, so in general, computing the four-point function is complicated, but we discussed that at low energies in the SYK model, the leading order term uh, at low energies comes from doing a simple path integral over uh, f, right? So here, if we want to compute this four-point function, we can, the leading term will come from this path integral over f, um, and, um, and so all we need to do is uh, all we need to do is take uh, the path integral over f and then take the g's f, let's say, well, two of the points appearing there. So these are the points, let's say this could be the points one, two, three, and four, uh, gf, three, and four, and then uh, the Schwarzian action we had there. Um, and so, we are interested just in calculating to leading order in the one over n, so we just do a Gaussian approximation to this function. So f will be the thermal answer, uh, phi tau plus epsilon of tau over beta. Um, uh, just for the sake of the argument, let me put beta equal to two pi, and then we'll restore it at the very end. Okay. Um, so then when we uh, insert uh, this into the action, we get integral n alpha over j uh, minus integral of epsilon double prime squared minus epsilon prime squared. Okay. Uh, that's just the expansion of this to second order, in, second order in epsilon. And then we can similarly expand this to first order in epsilon, so we'll get uh, some first order in epsilon expressions that involve epsilon and epsilon primes at various so we expand this to first order in epsilon, and also this to first order in epsilon, some epsilon and some dependence on T1 and T2, okay? I won't discuss all the details. Um, so the, the basic idea is that um, we have some, basically some coupling, so the type of Feynman diagram that we have is that we have some coupling between uh, this operator and epsilon, and then epsilon propagates, and then there is some coupling with the other operator, okay? And so the, the, the diagram corresponds to some in these four, there, there are, there's the propagation between any of these two points, and then we shall sum, and we get the final answer, okay? Um, okay. Now the behavior at late times, so we can uh, understand this in uh, an alternative way by thinking um, that this, uh, so we start, let's say, with epsilon equal to zero here in the past, and this operator creates uh, some physical mode of some sol classical solution for epsilon, and then propagates over Lorentzian time for quite a while, and then we couple to the epsilon we have here. Right? That will give us the long time behavior. It will be given by uh, the behavior of a classical solution of the epsilon action, of this action. So what are the classical solutions? So the classical solutions of this action are epsilon could be a constant, right? Um, well, I guess this is, uh, so we have four derivatives minus epsilon with two derivatives, right? Um, 
So could be a constant, uh, could be some linear term in tau in time, um, and there could be terms that go like exponential of time. This is for beta equal to two pi. Okay. So we have these four terms are the most general solutions. The fourth order equation, so there are four solutions. Now the ones that grow with time, this is the one that grows with time. Okay. So if we somehow um, uh, couple to the solution that grows in time, then uh, we will um, we will have a piece that will grow in time. So this simple argument tells you that you could have a piece that grows exponentially in time, and if you have that piece, it will grow exponentially in time with e to the t. Okay. Um, putting back beta, so we have this would be e to the two pi t over beta. Okay. So first, uh, le let me make sure it's at least plausible that given that this has uh, this action has this solution. Uh, then this correlator could grow exponentially, right? Is it uh, clear? <coughs> yes. Yeah. 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 Sure. Very, very good question. So we're talking about times uh, much bigger than beta. So the beta is the temperature and sets the time scale of evolution. For example, if you, when we looked at the two-point function, it was exponentially decaying with a constant proportional to, to, to one over beta, right? T over beta. So beta sets the, the, the scale of the evolution, um, and it's the energy, roughly the energy per particle that we have, uh, and then we want to go to times much bigger than this, okay? But we are going to times much smaller than log of uh, n over lambda, okay? so that we can trust the one over n term. Otherwise, there would be further, one, further corrections than what we are doing here. There would be higher order diagrams beyond the ones we're discussing here. So here, we're just computing the, um, so there is a constant, and then we are, there is a small uh, exponential deviation, right? And we're computing in this regime, okay? So this, when the, it, there is a small factor, one over n, in front, um, so this whole calculation, because of this factor of n, has a one over n, and because of this factor of j, there is a j times beta here, okay? So we get this factor. In addition, there could be other factors that grow exponentially. In fact, there are other factors that grow exponentially with time um, that do not have the beta j factor. But uh, since beta j is large in the low energy limit, we will ignore them, okay? So, okay, so the, the thing you could, should take from this is that, um, oh, first I should explain to you why we got this particular exponent. Um, so uh, why we got here one and not two or three or pi or set of three, right? So why we got this particular exponent? The reason is that the original action had an SL2 symmetry, right? Remember the SL2 symmetry we discussed of the general action for the Schwarzian? And that SL2 symmetry, when we think about um, about this thermal situation uh, correspond to uh, making changes which, um, as a, which correspond to basically shifting epsilon by a constant. That would be the SL2 symmetry that rotates the circle, the killing vector simply a displacement of time, right? And then there are two other which are conformal deformations of a circle which correspond to in Euclidean signature to cosine and sine of time, and in Lorentzian signature give this exponentially growing pieces, okay? So, let me say it in a slightly different way. So we started with a solution which went like time, right? And then uh, an SL2 symmetry of the original solution will give us a new solution. Let's say an infinitesimal SL2 transformation will give us a new solution. And when we rewrite that infinitesimal transformation in terms of a deviation for epsilon, it will give us epsilons which uh, go like e to the t and e to the minus t. So this solution is, uh, yeah, um, yeah. This solution is somehow spontaneously breaking some. Well, it's breaking some of the SL2 uh, symmetries, and when we act with the SL2 symmetry, we get these zero modes. And in principle, we are supposed to integrate over all these zero modes. Um, well, there, there is something a little more precise I could say, but let me not say for a sec. Um, so in some sense, the particular exponent here, so what I want to emphasize is that the particular exponent that we get here 
uh, is related to the SL2 structure of the original action. Okay? It came from the symmetries of the action. So we're not free to change this exponent in this approach. If the system is given by the Schwarzian action, we get a particular exponent, and the particular exponent is given by the symmetries of the original theorem. Okay. Uh, oh, sorry, tan was in the Euclidean theory, but in the Lorentzian theory, it's tangent. Tan is a finite number, too, right? And that's why you got the exponential that you are referring to. Uh, 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 oh, yes, 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 yes. When, once we put beta equal to... And to then, when you expand, you get the exponential. Yeah, when you expand, uh, you, get, uh, you get this factor in the... Sorry. Um, okay, good. So... Um, now, it turns out that when you do black holes, uh, we'll discuss uh, perhaps later, or maybe, well, maybe we'll discuss today, so. Um, why we also get the same expression when we consider small perturbations around black holes. So we can compute this out of time order correlator uh, around the black hole, and we also get the same, uh, the same behavior. Um, now, it, it turns out that you can prove, so the, separately of this, you can, argue that for any large n quantum system, uh, quantum system independently of whether it's an SYK system or large hand gauge theory or condensed matter system or whatever, uh, lambda should be less than, less or equal than two pi over beta, okay? Less than what we get here. So the, this SYK model is maximally chaotic. It has the maximal possible chaos exponent, okay? I, I haven't uh, shown you what, I, I haven't explained to you how, why this is the case, but it follows from general principles of quantum mechanics. Um, um, okay. So that uh, finishes the discussion of chaos in this model, of quantum chaos. And so the main points that you should get from here is that there is a measure of quantum chaos that comes from looking at commutators of two operators that are evaluated at different times, and that this is a useful notion of quantum chaos, and that is very parallel to classical chaos. So that uh, was point number one. Um, point number two is that you can use the technology that we discussed in previous lectures to actually do the computation in the SYK model, right? And it's a relatively uh, simple computation. Um, and, uh, and we get uh, an exponential growth with the maximal exponent. Um, so any questions? These are, these are the main points. Perhaps I, I will make one more point, which is that quant so the, we started with a model which was very quantum mechanical, right? Involving fermions. Fermions don't have a classical limit, so we had a very quantum mechanical model. But in the end, the, the chaos that we're finding is basically the, roughly speaking, is the classical chaos of this simple classical system, right? We had the Schwarzian system, and the Schwarzian system it's closely connected, as we'll see, as dynamics in hyperbolic space. So it's uh, similar in the sense that it's also governed by the SL2 symmetries. And, um, and so that classical system has exponentially diverging trajectories. And so we had quantum chaos became classical chaos of, the, uh, of, this, uh, of this system. Right? So we had, we had the fermion system gave rise, made, gave rise to the emergence of a particular classical variable. And then this classical variable displays qu classical chaos. Okay. Is that clear? Okay. Um, well, now you, you can you can ask a question, which is um, the following. Um, isn't it a problem that there is something that uh, grows exponentially, right? Isn't that an instability? I mean, if I, if I had told you that I, we do some calculation and then we find the classical solution that grows exponentially with time, that would have been an instability of the system, right? Um, so a, a property that is highly non-trivial of this, well that, 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 well, that will show up whenever you do this type of computations, is um, that this exponential growth arises in this type of operator ordering, but does not arise in other, in more ordinary operator orderings, right? So it does not, that does not arise when you consider ordinary time evolution. So 
And the basic reason is the following. So imagine we have, let's say, Euclidean time, and we consider the correlation function. Uh, I'm drawing these diagrams roughly represent the, the leading order contribution to the correlator. And then we'll have some one of these epsilons uh, propagating uh, between the two. Okay. So if we have this operator ordering, which is uh, the one that would correspond to uh, an in-time correlator, not an out-of-time order correlator, but to an in-time correlator, um, then when we um, cut the system here, um, this correlator on its own, uh, the original correlator, is uh, SL2 R invariant. And so the, this correlator will not couple to a mode of epsilon that is, um, that is a pure uh, SL2R transformation. So this e to the t is, comes from an SL2R transformation of the vacuum. If uh, this mode is SL2R invariant, then it will not couple to it. And therefore, this exponential mode will not propagate between these two. Okay? And so for that reason, we will not have uh, an exponential growth in, in time uh, correlators and non-time order correlators. This is uh, roughly, uh, roughly the, well, this is the reason, basically. Um, OK. Um, well, we could say a little more about this, but at least. Um, now, what, what, this computation that we did here of, the, uh, of this type of correlator, you can do it uh, for other, other problems. So you can uh, take a spin chain. Uh, on the, some lattice and do it numerically by exact diagonalization. You can um, take a weakly coupled uh, quantum field theory and then uh, do this computation. It involves uh, resumming some certain kinds of Feynman diagrams. And so you can compute this in uh, various systems. Uh, I, I think it's fair to say that in no system the computation is as simple as in this one. This is like the simplest case uh, where you can actually do the computation. Um, of course, if you did this for a weakly coupled theory, so maybe I should say what we expect in a weakly coupled theory. Um, so let me discuss the computation. For example, if you had n equal to 4 super yam mills and you plot it as a function of lambda, the Toft coupling, g square n. Uh, so this is a measure of the coupling. So n equal to 4 super yam mills is some supersymmetric version of chromodynamics. And uh, we do the computation at uh, finite temperature. Um, and so we would find, uh, initially, we would find something that is small, proportional to the coupling. And then for strong coupling, we expect it to saturate it at uh, the maximal value. Okay. And this computation is done using, bla uh, using black holes in a way that uh, we'll see later. And this is done by summing uh, some Feynman diagrams. And in principle, you can do it. At, uh, I, I think it hasn't been done for any quite the four super mls, but in principle, you can do it, and you expect to get the result proportional to lambda. It's been done for other weakly coupled theories, like pi to the fourth theory, which is not too different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but the problem is you need to be at finite temperature. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Now there is a, there is a fake way to introduce temperature, um, and um, well, I, I, I'm going into some tangent uh, based on prompted by this question. So even if you calculate the correlation functions of the theory in the vacuum, if you view the vacuum in Rinder coordinates, where um, let's say this is this is x0 and this is x1, this, these are two of the coordinates of uh, the d-dimensional space. This is the time direction and one of the spatial coordinates. So we can choose coordinates where uh, this is our time and our space is the radial direction. Um, then uh, from the point of view of an observer here, whose time is this one, um, we have a thermal system at finite temperature. That's the so-called Unruh effect. OK. Have you, do you explain this or not? Yes. How many people want me to explain this? OK, a few people. Well, this. Well, I'll give you a quick explanation, which might not be too, well, it's the way it was originally derived. Um, um, so not by Unru, but the, um, the, the idea is the following. So imagine that, um, um, so we can relate this. So imagine we analytically continue this time to Lorentz to Euclidean signature. 
then we would find that this time in Euclidean signature is just the angle around um, just the angle around the origin, okay? And in particular, it's compact with period two pi, right? That means that um, if we define Windler time in the usual way, so x plus minus proportional to r e to the plus minus tau, maybe there is a plus minus here. Um, so if we define the coordinates in this way, um, then the temperature in conjugate to tau would be one over two pi, right? because the length of the Euclidean circle is two pi. So that's the that's a quick derivation. Anyway, so the from the point of view of the right, we have a, a theory at finite temperature, and so you can do this whole computation of the out of time order correlator uh, in this case. So we can put one operator here. Um, well, you can put the four operators uh, here and take two of them that are highly displaced. Uh, so let's say we have two operators here and two operators near the near at time equal to zero, and um, and then this limit of operators is related to something called the Regge limit, and it's governed by uh, something called the Regge spin. And so the Regge spin and the Lyapunov exponent are the same in this regime. And there, uh, in n equal to four super young means, you can actually calculate the, the Regge spin, and it has this, this behavior once you translate it to these variables. Yes, yes, yes. So the, this, uh, the idea is that the um, so this four-point function in this particular limit is controlled by one anomalous dimension, which is the so-called Regge, the Regge and anomalous dimension. I won't tell you exactly what it is. But, um, so, and then you can um, compute this by the techniques of integrability and then find what uh, the behavior is. Um, okay. Um, Good, maybe, yeah. No, 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 no. Uh, well, le let me discuss the computation actually in the SYK model just to make it clear. Uh, no, no, it doesn't, it's not, so. Um, so, the, the que yeah, the question was whether it was always linear in temperature, either in the quantum or classical theory. So first we discuss the hyperbolic motion, right? And in the hyperbolic space, the chaos is determined by the curvature of hyperbolic space, not, not by the temperature. Actually, no. Yes. Temperature, uh, in order to okay. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. I, I think you don't, pr you probably don't need temperature. You could take, uh, for example, a highly excited state and then, uh, and then the results would probably, I mean, th this result would probably be similar if you took a, a high energy state, so some energy, so the state that the typical member of the microstate of the ensemble with this temperature. Uh, now, as, as we go down in temperatures, the dynamics becomes slower and slower. So you expect that any dynamics will be slower, and that's uh, why, yeah, you, you get the, now, we had a picture, the initial picture that we drew in terms of the tree of operators, that didn't depend on the temperature. So somehow you have this basic tree, and then when you're at finite temperature, you somehow drop down some of the branches of this tree. Um, but that basic tree grows with, uh, with a time scale, which is of order uh, j minus one, right? And so when you actually go and compute um, as a function of j, uh, you compute lambda, right? at some uh, given temperature. Um, so you find that for small, for, um, um, yeah, so for very high temperature, so let me, let me uh, express it as a function of the temperature. So for very high temperatures, uh, you find that the Lyapunov exponent is linear in the temperature, right? Um, no, it's, um, yeah, so it's, it's uh, I'm saying this wrong. It's for very low temperatures that it's linear in the temperature, and then for high temperatures, for temperatures of order j, uh, it becomes of order j, right? So this region here, uh, here is not proportional to the temperature, it's just proportional to j, which was set in the scale of the couplings, right? By going to higher temperatures, you don't gain anything, because once you get to the scale of the Hamiltonian, this tree was growing as uh, we just decided, and it doesn't grow faster. Um, when you go to lower temperatures, then you uh, have indeed this uh, linear behavior in the temperature. That's the, the picture of 
lambda as a function of time, of, of sorry, as a function of temperature. Any other questions? Um, okay, so how much time do I have? Five minutes plus 15 minute question. Um, okay, so I think I'm going to give you a little outline of uh, a little outline of the computation of this chaos exponent in gravity. Okay, so how do you do it uh, when you have a black hole? So imagine you have a black hole. Okay, so you have a black hole. This is uh, somehow a black hole. So we think that the black hole should be related to a quantum mechanical system, right? So this is a black hole with finite entropy. Um, and uh, so there is some quantum mechanical system. Um, and of course, we could draw the Penrose diagram of the black hole. So we have, let's say, some kind of boundary here. We could imagine this is a black hole in ADS. Then we, in those cases, we know what the quantum mechanical system is. Um, or this could be flat space or whatever. But we will be interested in, uh, in computing these out of time order correlators or chaos type uh, correlators. So we'll be interested in, um, let's say, the insertion of an operator. So if we, have, if we initially have the black hole, so we have this is the space time geometry. If we now act with some operator V at zero on the initial state of the black hole, it could be the thermal state. Then we will create, uh, the action of V creates a particle that goes into the black hole, okay? So we imagine V to be a simple operator that creates a little simple perturbation of the black hole, let's say, sensing the gravity wave or sensing uh, some, some particle that exists in this geometry. And th this state, this corresponds to the forward evolution of this state, but once you have this as a state in the quantum theory, you can also evolve it backwards in time, right? Without inserting any operator here. So if you evolve this backwards in time, you will get uh, a configuration where you have the particle coming in to the boundary, then reflecting from the boundary and go, then going back in. Okay. So that's uh, the picture for this state. Um, then, um, just maybe for the sake of the argument, uh, I'm going to to put this at, this at time equal to zero. So this is what we got so far. So this is the picture of one of the states. Um, and now uh, we act at W with W. Let, let's now consider the state W. Here I'm going to draw the state uh, W of t uh, times the initial state of the black hole. Um, this will be the time t. So here, again, we create a particle. And then if we evolve it backwards in time, we have the particle coming in now at time t and then going back in. So this was the v particle, and this is the, let's say, w particle, okay? Um, so those are uh, these two states. Um, now, we are interested in computing the out of time order correlator. Um, and so that was involving uh, a kind of inner product between two states. So we had v of zero, uh, w of t, um, v of zero, w of t. Now let me let me call this uh, state, let's say, psi one, okay, where we first act with v and then we act with w. And this we could think of as the dagger, right? Like psi. So we have another state psi two, which is given by acting with w, with v of zero. W of t, we'll see the pictures what they are in a second, um, acting on some kind of vacuum or thermal state. So if we take this and then now we take the dagger, then we get this, right? So this is the same as psi two, psi one. It's an overlap between two states, okay? So we can think of this correlator as the overlap between two states. What are the two states? So let's uh, give a picture of uh, the two states. Okay, here we are going to draw first the state psi one. Um, uh, so we had the black hole. And uh, is there a chalk of another color? Let's see here, blue. Um, 
So first, uh, we act with v of zero, which will create a state roughly what uh, we have over there. And um, then we'll create uh, w of t, right? So first we create the v of zero. The v of zero produces a state that was born here, and by the time we are at time t, uh, well, it will be flying roughly like around here. And then when we act with w, um, we create a particle here that then we can uh, take backwards in time, right? And so this is uh, where we can say exactly what happens when we want to evolve this backwards in time, there will be some collision here and we'll have to figure this out. Okay. So that's the step side one. And the step side two, um, and that will be the step side two, will be uh, now first we are with W of T, so we active with W of T and we evolve backwards in time. So when we are at some point backwards in time, we have, oh, W was the blue one. Uh, so we have this blue one here. Um, coming in, and then we act with V of zero, so then we have uh, this other line coming in. And we have to compute the overlap between these two, and the overlap between these two is basically the scattering amplitude between this in state and this, let's say, out state. Okay. So we have to compute in this overlap is the same as the scattering amplitude. So this is the same as some uh, scattering amplitude that we have to compute here. Um, and we're only interested in computing the scattering amplitude, a leading order in the one over n expansion, so that's a leading order in G Newton. And so it's given by some simple uh, Feynman diagram. So in principle, uh, we have these uh, particles uh, going through each other, and they're exchanging uh, some particles. Uh, they could be exchanging various particles. In particular, they could be exchanging a graviton. Now, we're not interested in computing anything. We are interested in computing this at very long times, when this time is very long, right? Um, when this time is very long, this particle will be very close to the horizon. This particle also will be very close to the horizon. And time translations here act like boosts here near the horizon, okay? Um, in fact, uh, near the horizon, a time translation at infinity locally looks like a Rindler time similar to what we discussed uh, for Rindler, uh, the, the Rindler time. Um, so that's a basic property of horizons. Um, and so computing uh, this amplitude at late times correspond to computing an amplitude where the boost angle uh, or rapid, relative rapidity between these two particles uh, grows like time, okay? And the boost angle is uh, two pi over beta, okay? So when we put in the betas and so on. Um, so we're interested in computing this amplitude for large boost angle. And the amplitude that grows, we're interested in the part that grows the fastest uh, with this boost angle. And so we're interested in the amplitude that grows fastest with energy, right? So we could exchange a scalar, a vector, a graviton, and so on. And the particle that grows fastest with energy is when we exchange the highest possible spin particle. In a gravity theory, the highest possible elementary particle is the graviton. And when you exchange the graviton, this leads to uh, a phase shift or scattering phase that is proportional to, uh, to the impact parameter or to, the, um, to basically this, um, um, this two pi t over beta, right? It's something proportional to G Newton and pi n t over beta. So we, we see that um, to lead in order, we get, uh, we get an amplitude that is uh, let's say one uh, plus uh, this uh, well, minus one. plus in, in reality is i g newton e to the this I don't remember the sign here there is one sign that is the correct one um, two two pi t over beta so again we get something that grows uh, with this maximal uh, exponent and um, uh, is the same as the one we found in the SYK model and which is a uh, the maximum you could, you could have in a quantum mechanical system. Right? So uh, in this computation, the particular uh, value of the exponent came uh, from, the, from two facts. So one is that time translations act like boosts in the near horizon geometry. And the second fact is how um, the scattering amplitude depends on the spin of the exchange particle how the scattering amplitude depends on the graviton spin, the fact that this is a spin two particle. For a spin j particle, we would have obtained the same thing 
with a factor j minus one here, okay? Where j is the spin of the particle. Maybe we should call it s is the spin of the particle. So for graviton, we get that. For a photon, we get something that doesn't grow. For a higher spin particle, we'll get something that grows even faster. So if we had a single higher spin particle, then it would violate this uh, general uh, theorem uh, saying that you, it could not grow faster than this. So um, therefore, uh, you cannot have a theory which has a single higher spin particle. Um, okay, so I think uh, we are into the question period. Thank you. I think there is one more point I would like to add, which is uh, that this is a three-level amplitude, and so in some sense, uh, this computation uh, can be viewed as a classical computation in the theory, right? So three-level three -level amplitudes follow uh, directly from expanding nonlinear in the classical Lagrangian, so again, this is another situation where the quantum chaos of whatever quantum mechanical system is dual to a black hole is really a classical chaos in the uh, gravity picture. And that unitization of this amplitude? Yeah, so the saturation corresponds to uh, the, this going to zero, right? This, uh, this out of time order thing going to zero. And what happens is that, um, if you sum all the diagrams that um, contain the exchange of many gravitons here, uh, you can view this as follows. So uh, you can uh, think of this in terms of a kind of shock wave calculation where you think of uh, one of the particles that carrying very high momentum, creates a shock wave, some, and then when you have the other particle, let's say, comes in, and then it uh, gets displaced. So this is the behavior in, in real time of what happens to the particle, right? And so if we are trying to compute the amplitude for, with an external state which actually was coinciding with this one, we'll get zero because this, the state has been displaced and it's going to, to this position. So that's what uh, gives the, um, yeah, the late time behavior and you can, what? Like exponential of minus exponential of zero. It's exponentiated, right, the three level amplitude? Yes, 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 yes. This three-level amplitude exponentiates, and well, you get something of the form G Newton uh, times, uh, let's say, P plus and P minus, where P plus and P minus still they are the the momenta plus and minus momenta of these two particles. They have a relative, so they have a relative factor for late times. There is a relative factor between these two of C to the two P, so we can also write it as C to the two pi T beta, right? So the displacement, so we, we, when we, um, if, if we think of this particle as having some fixed momentum, right? So let's say we fix the momentum of this particle, and then when the other particle goes through, the displacement uh, is, so th this is a display, I mean P is just uh, acting with the displacement. Uh, the displacement is, grows exponentially with time. So this displacement here goes like E to the T. This is, um, yeah, this is a time delay uh, property of, uh, of general relativity. So this is this is a very basic property of general relativity that when you have some energy and you send the light ray, the light ray will arrive later than it would have arrived if the energy wasn't here. This is an extreme case. Um, it's called the Shapiro time delay in general. So if this is the sun and there is light going near the sun, it, it arrives later. All right. I'm curious, this scattering of this spin to particle, is it 2D gravity or? Yeah. This, this is in, oh, everything I said here is in any dimension. For, it's valid for any black hole. But isn't there something weird going on in two dimensional, isn't there something weird going on in two dimensional gravity? Yeah, yeah, so this derivation that I explained today is not valid in two or three dimensions. Well, naively it's not valid, but it turns out that it's also valid. I mean, that's not, again, uh, for different reasons, uh, you find the same behavior. But there's, I mean, the goal of, I thought that the goal of the lecture was to relate the SYK model to a 2D to gravity. gravity. Yeah, yeah. So, so I, 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 yeah, let me, let me, I, I, perhaps there was a small break here in the logic. Um, the, here, what I discussed here has nothing to do with SYK. It's related to a computation in black hole physics. So we take a black hole and we do compute an out-of-time order correlator in the presence of a black hole. Okay. 
And uh, for a general gravity theory in any dimensions and so on, as long as there is a spin two particle, a spin two graviton, uh, we get um, we get this partic this um, well we, we get the maximal chaos exponent, right? We get this answer. Um, okay, thank you. And um, now, why why does it still work in two or three dimensions when there is no graviton? Um, the the answer is roughly that. Uh, there is a boundary graviton, so in those cases. So there's a graviton at the boundary of ADS3 or a boundary of ADS2, and morally, the spin of this graviton continues to be two uh, of this boundary graviton. But this is a quick explanation. I'll explain it perhaps more clearly next time. Well, let's say in two dimensions, you are familiar with the fact that the spin of the stress tensor is two. When the boundary is two-dimensional, uh, so at least in that case, it's true. Okay, uh, I think it's a dumb question, but you wrote the free energy for the SRK models, and you have like ground state energy plus entropy, yeah. and this entropy uh, depends on delta. Yeah. I'm asking, like, uh, this game between energy and entropy sometimes gives different behaviors to the theory. Is that a way that you can vary delta and maybe experience some phase transition inside the SAK model? Or is always the same behavior for every delta? Um, I mean, no normally these phase transitions come when you have, let's say, particles, right? that you can add, and they add both to the energy and to the entropy, and uh, then there might be a phase where you condense these particles, you create lots of them, or uh, that. Um, in, the, in the SYK model, we don't expect a, a phase transition. So you, you have, I mean, the, there is a different behavior, but it's a crossover. I mean, unless you get to the extremely low temperatures where you have a single state, and you have a trivial phase. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I mean, there are other variants of SYK where you add masses, and I mean, within this class of, uh, of Mellon-dominated theories, uh, you can find examples where there are phase transitions, large and phase transitions. So there, there's a phase transition because n is large. So in, in a quantum mechanical system with finite n, you couldn't have a phase transition, but because n is large, you could have a phase transition, and you do have them in some cases. Is there any observable that can be related to the out of time correlator, like in, in, a, in a general chaotic quantum yes, system? Yes, yes. Well, um, the, the, the out of time order correlator is an observable, but it's very difficult to compute because you have to evolve the system backwards in time, right? So if you had a quantum computer, right, or some quantum system that you, so let's say, suppose you have a quantum system that you can manipulate very, very well, right, that you can reverse the sign of the Hamiltonian. So for example, um, you could have some spin system, and, um, and in certain cases, you can uh, control the interactions between the spins, and you can control them so well that you can reverse their sign, right? So then you can evolve the system forwards in time for a while, and then backwards in time, and see uh, what happens, see that you recover the original system. And so people do these experiments, and they have done experiments like this, of evolving forwards in time and backwards in time. Um, now, the experiment we're talking about here is a little more complicated because you have to do this evolution, measure these operators, and so on. Uh, but th there have been proposals for how to do this for systems in the lab that you can, you know, build the system, be able to control the Hamiltonian well enough, and then evolve it forwards and backwards in time, and then see this. So it's a, this chaos discussion is a nice theoretical diagnostic, right? That you can compute theoretically and think it's useful for thinking about it but looks very difficult to measure directly. But this difficulty is related to mm, basically thermalization, that when the system looks thermal, right, it might be very chaotic and, and so on, but if it starts in equilibrium, the chaos just shuffles things around but does not uh, lead to anything that grows or anything that uh, behaves in a funny way. It's only by doing an experiment where you say, well, if I did the perturbation, I would obtain something, and if I didn't do the perturbation, I would obtain something else. 
is doing that, those kinds of experiments. But this question, if I did or if I not did, is related to evolving backwards and forwards in time. So that's, uh, that's why it's difficult to, to see directly in these thermal systems. It's also related to the fact that I, I mentioned that it's difficult to see something that grows exponentially in a system that is stable, right? So they're not going to find something that will grow exponentially. Any question? So you can you can view this um, you, you you can view this calculation that we we were talking about here. Um, so uh, let me. So we discussed uh, just this contour, funny contours that for computing this thing where uh, we walk backwards and forwards in time, right? Um, now we can. Uh, We can displace this by beta over two, um, and then view uh, this state obtained by evolution by beta over two as the thermal field double, so called, the so-called thermal field double state, which um, corresponds to, well, you, you know what it is, yeah. Yeah, to the thermal field double state, and then you can view this thing that grows exponentially as some kind of instability of the thermal field double state. So the thermal field double state is a very special state that under this evolution uh, develops uh, some instability. In fact, there is a fun paper talking about uh, the hydro, this chaos spreading in, in chains and so on as a kind of combustion. It obeys uh, equations similar to the equations that combustion waves obey. Uh, it's a paper by Yoffe. Um, uh, uh, I should give you the reference next time. I don't remember all the authors. Uh, Al Schuller is another. By con it's a paper by condensed matter theorist. I, sorry, I not, don't remember on top of my head the, the reference. I'll give it to you next time. Okay, if there are no more questions, let's thank Juan again. So we have a 15 minute break, and then we'll have a discussion of the exercises. So hopefully, there'll be an active discussion.